Masechet Yevamot, Daf Ayin Bet. We mentioned yesterday uh, the Pesukim in Yoshua that said that uh, in, the, in the generation of Yoshua, uh, they uh, did a mass circumcision because they had not done so in the desert uh, since the first generation that left Egypt. So the question now is, Why in the desert did they not get Berit Milah? Uh, what was uh, preventing them from doing Berit Milah in the desert? Uh, we'll see a couple of answers. Interestingly, Tosafot here uh, cites uh, Midrash called Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer uh, that Tosafot, uh, in the Tosafot's reading, sa- suggests that they did do Brit Mila in the desert. Uh, this Midrash says, Uchsheba Bil'am ra'at kol ha-midbar male me'or lotem she Yisrael. Bil'am saw that the whole desert was full of the foreskins of Israel. And then he, uh, and he said, Mi yuchal lamod b'zchut dam berit mila zot shehi mechoseh ba'afar ha'aretz. Who could come and withstand the merit of the brit milahs that they did um, that are covered by the dust of the earth? That is a halakha we, till today, cover up the uh, foreskin, bury it uh, in earth. That's what Bilam meant when he said these words. Uh, so from here you see, Kol Hamidbar, the whole desert was full. That suggests that they in fact did do Brit uh, Mila in the desert. The problem is that that would uh, contradict the Pesukim in Yehoshua. And the, also the context of the Midrash here actually is about Yehoshua. Uh, this Midrash seems to uh, locate Bil'am all the way at the end of the 40 years at, at the point when Yehoshua did the Brit Milah on them, uh, which is itself problematic because he does, it seems to be earlier during the time of Moshe. Um, so anyway, one way or another, this is a very interesting Midrash. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the Gemara says they did not do Brit Milah in the desert. Why? Maybe because they're on their journey and they're too weak to go undergo circumcision while they're traveling. Or another answer is because the northern wind, wind, wind did not blow. The hot weather was uh, a pro- problematic. The northern wind is a cool wind, but that wind did not blow. Uh, so that's the two reasons. Uh, the first one you'd have to say that um, uh, they did settle down in many in, in de- various places for a long time, but the problem is they didn't know when they would have to leave because it was their travels were dependent on the Ananakavod giving them the signals time to go. So at any point it could have been that they would do Brit Mila and then an hour later they have to leave, and that would be dangerous. So since they could not plan to remain in any place for a few days so that they could do Brit Mila and recover. Therefore, they did not do Brit Mila the entire time. Uh, going to the second one, it was just the, the weather was uh, just not conducive at all the entire time. Uh, how do we know about this northern wind? The entire time, the northern wind did not blow. Why? Uh, it's nice to have a northern wind, nice to have a nice cool breeze. Why didn't it come? Two reasons. First answer is because they were uh, banned because after either Cheta Egel or the sending of the spies. So they did not merit to have this nice northern wind. Uh, it was uh, you know, bad enough what they did and they got this punishment. They shouldn't get this uh, nice reward. And so this was part of a punishment. The second answer is that if the northern wind came, the northern wind is strong enough and it would, it might disperse the clouds of glory. And so, and that would be a, a worse problem. So that's why they did not come. Okay, why couldn't uh, Shem uh, make a northern wind and keep the clouds of glory if it was a miracle in the first place? Good question. You can look at Rishonim uh, who discussed that. The Papa says we can learn from this that any day that is either a cloudy day or there is a southern wind, uh, this would be bad weather. Southern wind uh, was known to be too hot and, and uh, just uh, just not good for healing. So we should not do a brit milah on that day, nor do bloodletting on that, on that day. Here's a picture of uh, doing bloodletting, also very dangerous, needs healing. And so if the weather is not conducive, then don't do it on that day. Uh, However, nowadays we look around, we see nobody cares about this. And even if it's a cloudy day, even if there's not a nice northern wind, 
but rather a bad uh, southern wind. People, they go ahead and they do brit milah and they do uh, um, uh, bloodletting anyway. And so therefore we rely on the pasuk that says, Hashem will, uh, will uh, preserve, will um, uh, protect the simple people. And so everybody's doing it, uh, so we'll go ahead and do it. And uh, that, that's also today. We don't really care about the weather when we um, uh, schedule a brit milah. Um, this pasuk and this context is used by poskim regarding other matters of health. Uh, for example, some poskim in the past have said, well, we know smoking is not is not good for you, but everybody does it, so shemem petem Hashem. Okay, since then, uh, most poskim have uh, recognized that, no, this is not even a, you know, a regular danger. This is an extreme danger, so smoking is not allowed. But what about uh, eating uh, eating unhealthy food? Uh, so we know this is not, it's not, not a good idea. Okay, but everybody does it, so... We could rely on Shemir Petei Mashem uh, if it's something that's so widespread. You can't say it's prohibited, there's a point, even if it's uh, not a good idea. Okay, Tenor Abanan, Kolo Tan Abim Shanash Yusbamin Bar Lo Haya Yom Shelon Ashaba Ruach Sephonit Bahasi Halaila. Even though we just said that during those 40 years they did not have a northern wind and therefore uh, they only had bad weather, so that's why they could not do Brit Mila. However, in the middle of the night, at midnight, they did have that northern wind come. So there was some uh, some uh, rachamim uh, given to them. Uh, even so, so why don't they do Brit Mila uh, if that's the case? Well, the northern wind only came in the middle of the night, and Brit Mila can only be done during the day. So I suppose that's why they said they could not. They could benefit it personally. They had some nice air conditioning, but it didn't help them with Brit Mila. How do we know that? Middle of the night. That's when Hashem um, uh, killed the firstborn uh, in Egypt. Now, my Tamuda, how does how does the pasuk mean that every night they had that? We learn from here that the midnight is a time of favor, and that is a significant thing. So this pasuk doesn't teach us that this happened all forty years, but rather this teaches us that. Midnight is when uh, God's mercy for uh, his people comes through. We see that by from the fact that uh, he attacked the enemies at midnight. And so therefore, we know that at midnight and all year round is a time of favor. And so because of favor, they, uh, Hashem relented on his anger uh, regarding the spies and allowed a northern wind to blow for them. Until today, the uh, midnight is considered a time of favor. And that's why when we say Selichot, uh, we don't say it at night, but rather only after midnight. Uh, when it is once again a time of et rason. All right, and now we get to the next topic, uh, which will take uh, till uh, um, almost this whole daf, and that is Amar Rav Huna Devar Torah Mashuch Ochel Bitruma Umidivrehem Gazru Alab Epenesh and Ereke Arehel. This is about a mashuch. It literally means uh, uh, stretching. This is talking about someone who tries to undo his circumcision uh, by uh, using different weights and things. They would uh, try to take some skin and, uh, and, and slowly pull it so that it will once again cover uh, cover the, their member. Uh, so as, uh, what, what's the status of someone who uh, does this procedure and undoes this? So it was known to be a painful procedure, but some people were embarrassed of having a circumcision. They tried to do this. What is the status of such a person? So from Midorai, Taravuna says, they can eat teruma. It doesn't matter. Once you do circumcision, you're good, right? It doesn't matter if you do this thing after. You can still eat teruma. You are considered circumcised. However, the rabbis came and made a gezera because it doesn't look right. This is a, a the person looks like they're uh, Adel. And so therefore, midra, midra banan, they said, no, no, you cannot eat teruma because you look like an Adel. Okay, that is Rav Huna's statement. We're going to see one challenge against it that will be refuted. A second challenge that will be sustained with a tiyuvta. So Rav Huna will be rejected. Nevertheless, after that, the Gemara is going to argue that uh, Rav Huna's statement is actually a machloket tanaim, uh, which means it's uh, we're reviving it again. So that's, we're going to see two disproofs and then say it's a machloket tanaim. So here's the first challenge, metibe. Mashuch sarich sheyimol. Here's a brayta that says someone who undoes the circumcision must do brit milah. Uh, there you go. Uh, so this says uh, that you have to do it. That sounds like midoraita. One has to. So we answer no midrabanan. That's all it means. 
Now, this is, seems like such an obvious answer. Right? Why were you even thinking when you asked, whoever asked this question, uh, doesn't, there's no name that, uh, that asked this, just the, the Gemara, the anonymous voice of the Gemara asked the question. What were you asking? After all, this Baraita says, Sarich Shimo. It doesn't say Chayav Limol. Uh, which would in- indicate the oraita, but sarichli mo. So it's kind of obvious that it's the edra banan. Uh, so questioner, what were you ask? What were you thinking? And the answer is that the questioner actually was uh, deriving this from the sefa. But you see from here the fact that there's, uh, the anonymous voice of the Gemara is asking a question about its own anonymous voice. Sounds like there's two different layers, an earlier anonymous voice and the later anonymous voice going back and saying that, asking, one, asking about that. So the later one says, answers for the first one and says, um, uh, no, the continuation of that Baraita, even though it wasn't quoted in full, is actually what led to the question that it looks like it's Doraita. Here's the rest of it. The Buddha Omer, Lo yimo sakanahi, lo Buddha says, no, if someone had had a circumcision and then his mashuch should not get a second Brit Milah because that is dangerous. Right? Leave him alone. Uh, we consider him uh, uh, to, have, to have a Milah. Doesn't have to do it. Uh, but then the other sages said back to the Buddha and says, wait a second, there are many people who got a Brit Milah, uh, um, uh, and during the time of Ben Kuziba, they did this, mashu- they were Moshech, and then they had children after. What is going on here? Ben Kuziba is the original, is another name for Bar Kochva. His original name is neither of those, but rather, Here's an actual letter that was found by archaeologists in uh, the Bar Kochva caves. And you see his name, his, his, he spells his own name. This is his, either he wrote it or he had to scribe write it. Um, it says Ben Kusba. Uh, amazing to find, to find this from his actual time, his letters. So his original name was Kosba. Doesn't mean anything, that's just his name. Those, the, his supporters called him Bar Kochva. They made a play on words, uh, as like Kochav is a reference to the Mashiach. And so they thought he was Mashiach, they called him Bar Kochva. Uh, after he failed, so his detractors called, renamed him Ben Koziva, which is what it says in the Talmud here. Kazav means a liar. He's the son of a liar. He was not really the Mashiach. Okay, that's his name. The point is that during the Hadrianic persecutions in one year 130, uh, Hadrian says you're not allowed to, to, to be, to do circumcision. And because of that, many Jews wanted to hide their circumcision and, uh, and were Moshech Be'or Latam. And so they did this procedure. And even though they did this to save their lives, nevertheless, they were able to have children after. And so you see, it's not dangerous. And how do you know that you have to recircumcise even after, and, and you can, it's okay, they did a recircumcision even after they did this. And how do you know that, and, and they were able to have children. So how do you know that one has to recircumcise? Two pisukim, one, shnemad himol yimol. In Bereshit, regarding Abraham, it says a double language, which we're, from which we, we learn, afilo me'a pe'amim, even if you have to do brit milah a hundred times. Hopefully not. But the point is that if one did Birimila and it was undone, then you have to do it again. This Pasuk is from the same context, just the next one. That says, Why do you have to add this on to the rest of the Pasuk that this person has broken my covenant? Who is it referring to? Oh, it's actually referring to, says uh, the Gemara, Mashuch, someone who had a circumcision and undoes it, is no longer part of the covenant, meaning they're considered now an Arel, so therefore they must do it again. Uh, so the point here of the continuation of the Beraita is we have, we learn from two Pesukim that one must in fact do a, an, uh, someone who does is, this, is Mashuch, has to do a brimila again, and we quote from Tupesukim that sounds like it's a deoraita. That's why the questioner asked, the, asked that question uh, from this braita. Look, it's, it's, it's deoraita, there's Tupesukim. And then we answer, no, no, uh, only midra banan. Uh, so that explains why he thought it was a question. Uh, now, uh, before we answer, uh, uh, before we answer for him, uh, we just want to analyze this braita. My ve omer, why do you have two pisukim? Why not just have not have enough with one? Maybe you'll say no. Himol, himol is not teaching. 
teaching us that someone who had already had one circumcision and they uh, they were mashuch, then they need another one. No, that's, this pasuk is teaching us a different thing, that if there are still some strips that are attached, uh, then they prevent the Brit Milah from being, being valid and you have to go and make sure to cut up, cut those strips. So we're already using that Pasuk for someone else. If you think that you need that Pasuk for that other law, then I'll give you a second one. Biriti Afar, that someone who is Mashuch, they are, they withdrew from the covenant and therefore they have to do Birit Milah again. Okay, good. Uh, so now that we explain the Baraita, let's go back and uh, explain how the um, uh, the uh, uh, how the the questioner uh, thought of it and how they answered. Who savar midikana sibla tamuda kirado raitahi he velahi midrabana nukras machta be'alma. The questioner over there who challenged Ravuna figured, well, since the Talmud, since the Braita brings a Pasuk, that sounds like it must be Doraita. But not necessarily, maybe even though it brings a Pasuk, the Pasuk is just there for, a, so for support to give some extra weight to a Dirabanan law. And in fact, it is a Dirabanan law. And so we once again uh, uphold Rav Huna, uh, that it's only a Gezerah Midrabanan, that someone who's mashuch has to do brit mila, um, and but uh, otherwise midorai on a doraita level they can continue to eat teruma. All right, so that takes care of the first challenge. We answered it successfully. Challenge number two: meti be tumtum and ochel bitruma nashav abadav ochlin. Okay, as so quotes a bunch of laws that aren't related, but let's explain all of them. To tumtum, someone whose uh, whose privates are covered up, so we don't know what he is sefek, male, female. So cannot eat teruma because there is a if it's a female it'll be okay because bat kohen but it may be a male and uh, therefore he is an arel because uh, it's covered up and he would he doesn't have uh, milah so that's why he cannot eat teruma but his wives and his slaves can eat now wives how could he have a wife uh, how could he how could he get married if he's all covered up there Gemara is going to ask uh, that question in a minute but he can have slaves because whether it doesn't matter whether he's male or female he can own slaves and they would be able to eat on account of him him her uh, good that's uh, so far so good mashuch if someone had this uh, undoing of the circumcision, or if someone was born already pre-circumcised, uh, that they, they can eat teruma. What you see here is that a mashuch is okay, can eat teruma, and is not 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 a problem at all. Um, so this is a challenge to uh, to Ravuna, who says that Gezera, this is Rabbanan Gezera, this is a challenge from the other side, right? This one is more mekel than Ravuna and says there's no Rabbanan problem uh, to it. Okay, that's going to be the source of the question, but we're going to continue. Androginos. By the way, there's a similarity between Tumtum and Mashuch. We'll see that in a minute. Androginos ochel bitruma ve'en ochel bakodashim. Androginos, someone has both uh, both signs. Uh, both uh, male and female uh, 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 privates. So that person can eat teruma because it uh, doesn't matter if we consider him a female, fine, bat kohen. If he's a male, then he does circumcision on his male member, so that's fine too. Uh, so he can eat teruma, it just cannot eat uh, kodashim uh, because only males can eat kodashim, not females, and so that that's that's a problem. And Zorginos in general may be male, may be female, may be a third category altogether. And so a third category, so anyway, if he's a female, cannot eat. Uh, Kodashim. Tiruma, however, men, male and males and females can eat Tiruma if they are from a family of Kohanim. And then now the Baraita ends by repeating Tumtum and Ochel, Lo Bitruma, Velo Bakodashim, just adding on that not only does he not eat Tiruma, as said above, also Tumtum cannot eat Kodashim because also he may be female. Again, I was going to address why the Tumtum is uh, repeated here, this law of him not eating Tiruma, why is it repeated at the end? All right, that's the Braita. Katani Mihad, now zero in on the part that we need. Mashuch venolad kishu mahul hare elu ochlin. And yet it says that someone who has is mashuch and also someone who's born circumcised, they can eat teruma and there's no need for a dirabana, there's no dirabanan law, no need for them to do brit uh, milah again. Tiyubta drabunat, tiyubta. And this is a conclusive 
challenge to Rav Huna. All right, we're going to see in a minute that we're going to try to revive it and say actually it's machloket between two Tanaim. And so you could say this, but Aita is only according to the other Tana, and Rav Huna could follow a different one. Okay, but before we do that, we just want to analyze this Baraita. Amar mor tumtum eno ochel bitruma nashav avadim ochlim. So we mentioned tumtum does not eat tiruma himself, but his wives and slaves can eat. We understand why a slaves nashav the tumtum minale, but how can he have wives? Um, so if you want to say ilema de kadesh, maybe he does. He does, uh, assuming he's a man. Uh, he goes and gives a ring to a woman, right? Well, so what happens in such a case? The Tanya, Tumtum Shekidesh, Kiddushav, Kiddushin. If a Tumtum goes ahead and, you know, you know, assumes he's a man and then gives Kiddushin to a woman, the Kiddushin is valid. Nit Kadesh, Kiddushav, Kiddushin. And if he acts like a woman and a man goes and gives her, her a ring, then that Kiddushin also is valid. So, so here you go, right here, how, that's how he can have a wife, if he uh, gives Kiddushin to a woman. But we say, no, don't think that would be, that would be valid for Tirumah. We only said this Lechumra, because maybe, just in case he is a man, and then he gives a Kiddushin to a woman, so Lechumra, we say, he is prohibited to all her, her relatives, she is prohibited to his relatives, as, uh, as anyone married would be. But Lechumra, Amrina, do we apply this? For leniency to say that she can, if he's a if he's a kohen, then now she can come in, into his household and eat tiruma, right? We would not not say that for sure. No, sefek ishahu ve'en isha mekadeshet isha because maybe he's not a man. Maybe he actually is a woman. As it's an interesting phrase, sefek isha should be he, but who? What is he? Right? And anyway. If he is, he is an Isha, Isha who gives, who gives a ring to another Isha, there's no Kiddushin there, and therefore there's no Kiddushin. So we only say the Chumrah, maybe he's a male and the Kiddushin works, but maybe not. So therefore, uh, don't bring me a, any proof from this Baraita for sure that we act the Chumrah in terms of uh, in terms of uh, allowing them to eat teruma. Okay, so that's all the question. Uh, we didn't answer it yet. That's the question. Tum Tum, how could he have a wife? Two answers. Amar Abaye kishe besav nikadot mi bachus. So it could be his, uh, even though the skin covering up his member, but the testicles can be seen, so we know that he is a male. Uh, that's what it's talking about. He gives Kiddushin to a woman, and so this Kiddushin is good Kiddushin, and uh, she can eat Teruma. That's what it's talking about. Now, why can't he himself eat Teruma? Because uh, since the rest of his uh, genitalia are covered, he doesn't have Berit Mila. So he himself doesn't have Berit Mila, but his wife, who he does Kiddushin with, uh, can eat teruma. That's Abaye's answer. Rava Amar, my nashav imo. Rava says no, he can't have a wife. There's no way. I don't uh, accept that's limiting that limit that limiting case. But rather, it's talking about his mother. What does that mean? It means that his mother was a bat Yisrael. She married a kohen, so she was able to eat teruma. Her husband, this kohen, died, and so now what happens to her? Let's say she has a son who's a tumtum. Oh, this son, who's a tumtum, keeps her connected to her deceased husband, who was a kohen, and she she can continue eating teruma. Well, it says nashav. The word the word isha nashim is in fact uh, uh, has two meanings. It can mean wife or it can mean a woman, and so here it means woman, meaning his mother. Okay, imo peshita. We say no, if it's talking about his mother, isn't that obvious? He has a, she has a child. Anytime you have a child, uh, that child will connect her to the or the her husband and uh, being a, being connected to a kohen's family. So of course, mahodetema molid machil shen molid eno machil kamash malan. Well, we would have thought only a child who themselves can give birth to another child can allow their mother to eat. But a child who cannot give birth, and a tumtum, is impossible for them to give birth, uh, to, have a, to have a baby uh, of, of a next generation, I, I might say that person does not. Because after all, the point is that they have children and they will go on. But if that stops there, then it's almost like they don't have a child. So I might have thought that, Kamash Mala, no, that's, that's why this Brata comes to teach. Otherwise, it doesn't matter, even though Tumtum can have a child, is still, a, is still themselves a child sufficient for the mother to continue eating Teruma. Okay, that's the two answers. We're going to challenge Abaye's answer. 
that uh, it's nibesav nikarot mi bachutz. Tashema tumtum eno oche lo betruba velo bakodashim. The challenge is from the last line of the Braita. Remember, it was uh, it was a repetition. The the Braita started off telling us tumtum eno oche betruma, and so why does it why does it repeat it and say eno oche betruma velo bakodashim? So we're going to support Abaye actually and a challenge Rava. So bishlama le Abaye. According to Abaye, he's the one that says So that's talk that Resha is talking about. He's definitely an Arel. Because we can see his Betsim, we know he's a male, and we know that he didn't have Brimila because the rest of him is covered. And so that person cannot, he cannot have uh, Teruma. And so the Sefa says, well, that's, um, that's when I know for sure he's an Arel. And the Sefa comes to repeat Tum-tum, to tell me that if he's for sure uh, uh, that he's safek, um, uh, also, Arel also cannot eat. So that's why he's coming to add another case, right? The Resha was when we saw his Betzim, so therefore we know he is an Arel, so for sure, therefore he cannot eat Teruma. And it repeats to say, even if I can't see anything, and I don't know what he is, and maybe he's a female, and in that case you could eat Teruma, Bat Kohen could eat Teruma, but maybe not. So Safek also does not eat Tiruma. So uh, this all makes sense according to Abaye. Eh al Rava tum tum de Sefa la Mali. But according to Rava, who says that it's talking about the mother. Uh, so that's not, not not a different time, type of tum tum. So then why do I have to repeat the another uh tum tum again? My my tum tum are Rava answers. Oh, when it says tum tum at the end, it's actually not talking about a tum tum, but rather talking about someone who is an Arel, not circumcised. Uh, the, the similarity is that I hinted to before is that both have skin covering their member. Uh, one completely covering, so we can't know what it is. One covering the top of it. Uh, but that's why it might refer to tum tum, an Arel as a tum tum. Okay, even so, we continue to challenge uh, Rava. Hashta sefek Arel la Achil, vaday Arel Achil. If the first case, which you said is talking about a, a, a regular tum tum who is totally covered and we don't know what he is, and he cannot eat teruma, so then the sefa, which you said is an Arel, and for sure Arel. Um, could might you might even think could eat all the more so cannot eat. So why do you have to uh, why do you have to uh, repeat this case? Why do I have to mention this case at all? I could figure it out myself. And the answer is mata amka amad. It's actually giving a reason. Um, the second one's giving a reason for the first matam tum tum eno ochel b'truma. How come a tum tum cannot eat truma? Because we're not sure if he is a male and then he has a member and he needs b'dimila, so he's considered adel. And then the sefa comes and adds. Uh, someone who is a tum tum is possibly an arel, and an arel for sure does not eat teruma or kodashim, and so that's the in answer for Rava, and so that concludes the uh, uh, discussion of that baraita, and so now we can get back to Rav Huna and uh, try to argue that uh, Rav Huna's position is actually one side of a machloket tanaim. Mashur v'nolad keshu mahul v'ger shnit kayer keshu mahul v'katan shavar zemano ush ar kol animolim l'atu yemish yesh lo shte aralot ena animolin ela bayom. So the following baraita says that someone who is moshech or lato tries to undo the circumcision or is uh, born mahul, but these words are erased by some. Again, a convert uh, who converts and is already circumcised before he converts. Uh, he converted because uh, maybe he's an Arab and he converted, now he's, con- now he's converting. Uh, or a, a baby, an infant, whose eighth day has passed. Uh, and so he cannot, be, he cannot be circumcised on his eighth day. And so now it's pushed off to another time or other nimolim. Now that's the now the Gemara uh, uh, inserts itself and says, "What do you mean?" And others, who is that coming to include? Someone who has two foreskins, uh, in which case uh, one needs to cut both of them. 
Uh, all these people um, have to get their Birit Milah during the day, uh, even though they're uh, off time or, you know, uh, unusual circumstances still have to be during the day, just like a Birit Milah on the eighth day. But Bibi Lazar Bar Shimon disagrees and says if it's on the eighth day, a regular Birit Milah, then it has to be during the day. But if it's already that time passed or any of these other situations, including a mashuch, uh, then it can be at the, during the day or at night. That's the Braita. Now we're going to try to prove that these, the Tanakama versus Rabbi uh, El Azad and Bar Shimon are arguing on two sides of this question that Rav Huna spoke about. So it makes sense to say that uh, the first opinion says that it's the, that mashuch is considered the oraita. Uh, you did, had a circumcision, undid the circumcision, so then you need to do another one as the oraita. Therefore, it has to be during the day, just like a regular brit milah. Uh, whereas Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Elazar Bar Shimon, who says, no, you only have to do it mid banan. Since it's only did banan, that's why you can do it at night. And so maybe that's the two sides here. Uh, then we reject this. Fetizbera, katan, shavad, demano, mika, lemanda, madra, banan. Why are you saying all the things in this, uh, in this beraita are older banan, and that's why they can be at night according to the Bielazar Bar Shimon. Even an infant who, let's say he was born on, uh, during the, uh, the, uh, uh, uh twilight. Uh, after sunset on Friday afternoon, and then so you don't do it on the next Shabbat, we push it off till Sunday. So you're saying that's not, that's only the Rabbanan, not the Oraita. It doesn't make sense. No, Ella, they call the Amma Mashuk the Rabbanan. Rather, it could very well be everyone that's Beraita thinks that it is in fact the Rabbanan. Well, in any case, that would still uh, be beneficial to Rabbuna, who would have a, a, a Beraita to support him. But the point is that it's not a Machol Ketanaim here. Vekatan Shavazabano de Oraita. And uh, whereas the other case here, uh, the katan not after the eighth day is in fact the oraita. So what are they arguing about? Tanakama and Rabbi El Azar. Mor sabar dashinan u bayom. Mor sabar lo dashinan u bayom. When it says uh, regarding. So from that we learn that when it's on the eighth day, it has to be during the day. From the extra vav, we learn that not only uh, this case, the regular eighth day, but even other cases, even someone whose time has passed also has to be on the eighth day itself. Uh, it has to be during the, even whose time has passed, has to be during the day. No matter what day you're doing it, it has to be in the daytime and not at night. And that we know about uh, for the Deoraita law, that regarding a, a a baby past the eighth day, and then the mashuch, which is even though it's only the rabbanan, we include with it because when the rabbis say, "Oh, this is the rabbanan," so this person has to get another brit milah, so they're going to make it like the oraita and say it also has to be during the day. Uh, whereas the other opinion says, "No, we don't learn from the ubayom just because it has an extra vav. That's not so significant. We don't learn from the extra vav." So that's what we're talking about. But in fact, everyone agrees that this is. The Rabbanan, so it's not a We're now going to back up this interpretation because, after all, there's another similar case where we also use an extra letter to teach about something being done uh, during the day. One time, Rabbi Yochanan, he was giving a derashan, he was saying the following halacha, Notar bizmano eno nisraf el bayom, shelo bizmano nisraf ben bayom ben balayla. A korban, who that's time has passed and you cannot eat, any more, can't eat it anymore, is called notar, and it needs, it needs to be burnt. If it's that very morning that is the cutoff point and you can't eat it anymore, then it has to be uh, burnt during the day. But if that time has passed also, and now it's not the first morning when it should be burnt, and we still have to burn it, but if it's not that time, then you can burn it both during the day and during the night. Okay, that was his halacha. Now, ve'itibe Rabbi El Azar le Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi El Azar. Rabbi El Azar stam is Rabbi El Azar ben Pedat. A student of Rabbi Yochanan who asked him, "En li ela ni mol shmidishmini she ni mol ela bayom minayin le rabot tishah la asara la achad asar le shnei masar minayin tamudomar u bayom." So here's the question. He said, "Well, I'm going to compare the case that you presented to a case of Brit Milah, where uh, we said I only know that someone, a baby that's uh, circumcised in eighth day, has to be during the day. What if it's circumcised on the ninth or tenth or eleventh or twelfth? This would be cases when it's born." Uh, 
uh, during Ben Hashem Mashot on Friday afternoon, and let's say the next week, so then what you can't do it on Shabbat, you'd usually do it on Sunday. Let's say Sunday is Yom Tov, and Monday is Yom Tov after Shabbat, so then it's going to be pu pushed off until, uh, until Tuesday. Uh, so that would already be the twelfth day after, and so how do you know that any of days, any days after the eighth day, uh, it also has to be during the day and not at night? Because it says u bayom, and then he continued and said vafilu leman de lo darish vav, and even according to those who do not uh, derive anything from the extra letter vav, right, referring to to someone who says that. Oh, now we know it's Rabbi Lazar Bar Shimon over here. So he says even according to the one who disagrees regarding Brit Milan says that uh, afterwards it could be at night. Vav he daresh, uh, when it comes to two letters, then they will agree. And that's here regarding notar. Here's the pasuk. It says veha notar mi b'sarazabach bayom. So since it has two letters that are extra, because you said notar mi b'sarazabach, so that is coming to include not only when it's um, uh, the the, uh, the the first morning after when it's called notar, but even afterwards it has to be during the day. And so therefore, uh, whether it's uh, everyone agrees that it has to be during the day. And this is a challenge that the Azad told Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said that if it's not the right time, it could be uh, burnt at night or during the day. And he just said, no, there is no opinion. There is an, op there is an opinion about that like that regarding B'rit Mila, but no opinion like that regarding Notar. So what we do see here, and we see here ten tangentially, is that uh, with his the reference to two opinions regarding B'rit Mila. So this supports the uh, our interpretation just now that there's Machlok about the U Bayom and not whether it's the Rabbanan or the Oraita. A continuation of this very story here, which is fantastic, it says, Batanan de Nafak, Amal Rabbi Yochanan le Shakish, Raiti, Le Ben Pedachi, Yosheva Duresh, Kemoshem, Piha Gebura. So after Rabbi Al Azar left, that student, and Rabbi Yochanan seemingly he did not have an answer. He was quiet, he couldn't think of an answer. So he was actually proud of his student. And he told his says Chavrutad uh, Lakish says I saw Ben Pedat Bielazar Ben Pedat he was sitting and he was deriving laws it was like Moshe Rabenu hearing directly from Har Sinai when you're able to make a make a connection and derive something and it's uh, legitimate and convincing it's like new Torah a new revelation as if you're hearing it straight from Moshe's mouth straight from God's mouth so he was so proud that to hear that Amar Le Resh Lakish Didehi Matnita He Resh Lakish said oh, don't be be too excited. You think that Rabbi El Azab ben Pedat made it up? No, he was quoting a, a Tanaitic source. Matnita, uh, quoting, quoting a Tanaitic source. Hecha Tanale. Uh, where is it? He asked. You know what? What are you talking about? I never heard of that Tanaitic source. I thought he. I thought he derived it on his own. And uh, the Shakish answered, "Betorat Kohanim." Torat Kohanim. We call it today Sifra. This is the Midrash uh, uh, from the times of the Tanaim on Sefer Vayikra. Uh, it's very, very uh, difficult, uh, very complex midrash, and it's in there. Uh, so Rabbi Yochanan did not know it, so he made up for it now. Nafak Tanya bitlata yome besabra bitlata yarche. So Rabbi Yochanan went and he spent three days studying it by heart, learning it by heart, and then three months uh, going and analyzing it to have a full understanding. This is fascinating. Uh, first of all, this is an amazing feat to memorize the Sifra in three days, uh, but it also shows a couple of things. Number one, while we can expect that everybody knew Mishnah by heart, all the all the Amoraim knew Mishnah and they could analyze and all that, something like Torah Kohanim, a Midrash Tanaim was not necessarily known by everyone. Uh, but uh, those who did learn it, this is this shows the system of how you would learn in those days, uh, because it was all oral. So it's not like he went and just uh, looked up that one passage in the manuscript, uh, but rather he learned it by heart. And so first you learn the whole thing by heart. So that's the equivalent of like buying a book, except you don't buy a book. You actually have to acquire it, not just put it on the bookshelf, put it in your mind, word for word. And only then you go and he analyzed the the uh, the uh, analyzed uh, the the midrash. And that took three months, and so he realized that, oh, I'm missing good information that's in Torah Kahat Kohanim, right? I didn't know that, so uh, now he makes up for his loss, which also shows another thing, never too late to go and make up uh, uh, for knowledge that, uh, uh, a, gap, a gap in knowledge that you should have known. So, okay, so you didn't learn it when uh, beforehand, learn it now. The next and last section of the daf returns to a topic that 
uh, we started on the previous stuff, which is how we got into the, this in the first place. And that was about Ad, uh, Adel, uh, someone who's not circumcised. We Yesterday we were talking about receiving the waters of Para Aduma, and we tried to prove it from the fact that in the days of Yeshua, uh, they got in on the 10th, and we were working out the calendar, and that's how we got into the uh, discussion of the fact that Bene Sel were not circumcised in the desert. Okay. That we talked about, but now the question is not can the Nadel receive the Paraduma waters, but can he be the one to sprinkle? If he's a Kohen, so he's an Adel, but he's still a valid Kohen, can he do the sprinkling? Rabbi Elazar says, yes, he can. How do you know? Because a Tibul Yom also can. A Kohen who became Tameh touched a dead mouse or something. And then he went to the mikveh during the day in order to become fully tahor so that he could eat tirumah, right? Remember, go back to the very first Mishnah Masech Berachot. Uh, he has to wait till nightfall to eat tirumah. But even before nightfall, as long as he went to the mikveh, he's called tevul yom, and he can perform the para aduma. <clears throat> this was a huge machloket between the Pharisees that says, yes, he can do that, and the rabbis also said he can. Uh, and against the Sadducees and the Dead Sea sect who said, no way, he has to be fully tahor. So this was fundamental to the rabbis. And so here's his point, uh, just like a tevul yom, can sprinkle, so too an Arel can sprinkle. Shafa Pisha so bitruma kasher be para. Because a Tibul Yom also cannot have Tiruma, and yet he can have he can do the para. So too an Arel cannot eat Tiruma, but can do the sprinkling for the para. And now we challenge this. Wait, is this really comparable? Mali Tibul Yom she can mutar be maaser. Tibul Yom has another leniency that he can also uh, eat a maaser, which is not true of an Arel. Uh, so we say, no, we'll clarify. We weren't talking about eating tiruma and eating uh, maaseh. We're not comparing that. You're not, after all, drinking the paraduma waters either. We're, we're comparing the touching of all these things. So Yom cannot even touch tiruma. Uh, and he can uh, he can touch and sprinkle the paraduma waters. Adel shemutar benigiah and odin shemutar be para. So now it's even more so. And Adel can touch a uh, teruma, uh, not a problem for him. It's not, he doesn't have a tuma problem. Uh, so all the more so you can't make teruma tame. Uh, so all the more so that he should be able to uh, sprinkle the paraduma waters. Okay, so that is the. Thesis of Rabbi El Azar. First, we're going to support it, and then we're going to challenge it. Tanya na mehachi adel sheza hazato keshera masehaya vechshiru chachamim hazato. Beraita says that yes, an adel can sprinkle the waters, and and actually there was a case where it happened, and the rabbi said it's fine. Challenge. Meti be tum tum shekidesh kidusha pes pasul tum tum. This is not doesn't mean he did kidushin with a woman. We talked about that already. But that, this means that he took ashes from the paraduma and mixed them with the water. So he sanctified uh, a mixture of water for to be used as paraduma. Uh, one of the thing, one of the uh, steps in preparation. If he does that, pasul no good. See, this is a, a challenge here. Because uh, because we don't know what's under there, and he may be a male, and if he's a male, he's not circumcised. You see explicitly, Adel cannot do paraduma actions. But goes on, Androginos kidesh kidusha kasher kasher. So Androginos did it. That is fine because Androginos. Um, Although we're not sure if he's male or female, his male member does get a circumcision, so he is circumcised. And if he's female, that's okay too, according to Tanakama. Buddha disagrees and says, yeah, if he's a man he's circum and he's circumcised, fine, but he may be a woman. And therefore, his kiddusha kiddushin are not are not good because women are not cannot uh, do perform para aduma. So we're going to see, we'll talk more about this machloket in a minute. But the point here right now is up here. Everyone agrees that arel no good. arel safek arel pasul kadesh. And so this is a challenge to Rabbi El Azar. Amar Rav Yosef, hey Tana Tana Debe Rabbi Akiba, who said Rav Yosef, so this this baraita here 
is the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. Now, what doesn't go against Rabbi Al-Azhar has a Braita that he supports him. This is Rabbi Akiva. Because Rabbi Akiva, he compares Arel and Tameh and, and includes uh, Arel with the language of Tameh. The Tanya Rabbi Akiva Omer, Ish Ish Rabot He Arel. The Pasuk regarding Teruma said, Ish Ish, anyone who is Tameh, he's a, a Zav or so on, cannot have Teruma. Why is say Ish Ish twice? To include Arel. So just like an Arel cannot uh, be with, uh, cannot have Teruma. And Teruma is one sanctified uh, object, and so too he compares that to other sanctified objects, and so an Arel cannot. Uh, be uh, cannot be involved in the para aduma water process. So that's this is Rabbi Akiva who says you cannot. Uh, that's he's the author of this baraita, um, and uh, so Rabbi Al Azad disagrees. He has a different baraita. Amar Rava. Now Rava is going to challenge Rabbi Yosef's uh, limitation of this baraita. Is it really only Rabbi Akiva? Have I atibna kamed Rabbi Yosef? He was sitting before Rabbi Yosef. Kashya li and he asked. La lish tame tana le vilitneha arel va tame velema rabi akibahi. Why does the tana, how come the tana of the braita, why does he leave out the following words? He should say them. He should say put arel and tame together. And then I would know for sure it's rabi akiva. Right? You could write over here, mi pene shu safek arel and say, ve arel ve tame. Right, pasul lekad pesulim lekadesh, and then I'd know. Oh yeah, that's Rabbi Akiva because he compares Arel and Tameh. Right, this should be either this Braita or some Braita somewhere that says both of them, and then I would know it. Any but any Braita can you find? Uh, Velos and the Gemara says actually there is one Braita that has them together back to back, not in this context of uh, Tiruma or. Paraduma, but in a different context. Uh, when you come to the Beta Mikdash to visit on the holidays, you have to bring Korban Re'iyah. And yet there's a Braita that says, says someone who's uncircumcised and someone who's Tameh do not do it. So there is a Braita that puts them together. And so now we can see that, yeah, this uh, this could support and uh, 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 answer Rav, Rav's question. There is, in fact, a Braita that puts them together. So it makes sense that the Biakiva is the one that puts them together. And there is a Braita that says, uh, makes such a connection. But we reject that and said, no, Hata Mishum de Ma'is. There, the Adel cannot bring the Korban Re'iyah because he's repulsive, right? What are you doing here with uh, uh, Adel? No Brit Mila. Uh, it's not appropriate for him to come to the Beit HaMikdash. So it could be a separate reason, maybe not necessarily connected to Tameh. Uh, so this, uh, this is not a, a good source for the Braita that Rava is looking for. Okay, and now we say, who back to this Braita, now that you quoted it, uh, that does have a machloket. Uh, Tanakama said that a tumtum can do para aduma because uh, he may, uh, sorry, androginos can do para aduma because even if he's uh, a woman, that's okay. A woman can perform paraduma. The Buddha says, no, a woman cannot perform paraduma. So now we're going to focus on that and uh, say, Vazdula Tamayu, when in fact we see another Braita where that matches up to what this one. So according to Tanakama, anyone could do paraduma except for someone who's deaf or uh, not mentally competent or a child. But you see, it doesn't exclude a woman. So a woman can do paraduma according to Tanakama, as I said before. And the Buddha says he disagrees on two points. Number one, he says a katan can. Uh, can do it, but not an Isha, and therefore also not an Androginos. Androginos, maybe he's a male, and it will be okay, but we don't know. We may consider him a uh, a woman or a third category, and so therefore uh, cannot. Okay, so you see that Abiyudah also follows an opinion that it says a woman cannot, Tanakhama says a woman can. All right, good. Now, uh, last point, what's their source? My Tama de Rabbanan, what's the source for, for the rabbis to say that a woman can uh, perform para aduma? So it says in plural, they, anyone, can take. 
children bekidush. Hanach de kesherin basifa kesherin bekidush. Those who are, are no good cannot do the gathering, also cannot do the mixing with the ashes with the water. But those who can do the gathering can do the mixing. A woman can gather and therefore can also uh, do the mixing. You see that they are mentioned back to back here. This entire pasuk is talking about the mixing of the paraduma ashes with the water. And this verb is actually going back to here when it says ve'asaf. And so you see it's just picking up on whoever can do the asifa. Uh, what that includes women. So also here ve'lakechu, that was uh, that very same person. And that includes women can also do the v'lakechu and the natan, taking the ashes and mixing it with water. Uh, so therefore, that's uh, the proof of Rabbanan, that women also can do uh, do the mixing of the para aduma waters with the ashes. Um, okay, good. V'rabi Uda, we're going to respond to that. Ma'alachim kene ma'kera v'lakach. My velakehu, but you could have just said velakach. It said ish tahar before that was singular, so it should it continue with singular here? Why does it say plural? Our uh, plural must be coming to include someone, someone new. Even someone who could not do the gathering before can do this, and he says that's referring to a katan. So you see, this explains the difference between katan that he, uh, which he also disagrees with. Uh, the point is that they are in fact different from each other. And so once they're different from each other regarding katan, that katan is included. Uh, and so, and not isha. Where we say, wait, isha name. Why not come include isha as well over here? Uh, natan velo natena. And his answer is because of the rest of the pasuk. Uh, it says, uh, if, uh, if it could be a woman also, should ve venatena. She will uh, put the water. But it says venatan in uh, masculine. So therefore, no, natan. And not the venatena. Okay, but Rabbanan, so Rabbanan, no, that's a good question. How come it says a plural here? Velakehu. It says, I katab velakach venatan havamina shakel had veheb had. Katab rachamana velakehu. If it had singular in both lakach and natan, I would think it's this very same person that has to do the taking of the ashes and putting it in and the mixing with the water. So this was velakehu that it could actually be two different individuals that do these two steps of the process. That's why it says velakehu. And if you make them both plural, then if it said uh, plural in both, then I would have said that it has to be actually two people that take this one and two people that take the other, that do the next step. And so therefore, it says, no, it doesn't matter. Even if two people take the ashes and one person actually places them in the water, um, then nevertheless, the ritual is valid. So uh, he explains the, uh, the, the, the singular, singular and plural in a different way. And so in any case, we have that both uh, der- derivations for both Tanakama and Rabbi Yehuda. And um, Rabbi Yehuda, and last point about this, uh, Midrash v'hizah tahor al hatameh. Uh, why does it say that the tahor will have to sprinkle on the tameh? Um, isn't it kind of obvious that uh, any any uh, Bet HaMikdash uh, related ritual, this is um, also called meh hatat, it's like a hatat, it would have to be done by a tahor, by a kohenus tahor. Why do we have to say this? Tahor mikelashu tameh. Well, it must be when it says tahor, it means that it just means it's more tahor than someone else who's tameh, right? Uh, so it's in by comparison. So the medatibul yom shika be pada. And so this is the derivation that we uh, started, um, that we had at the beginning of this discussion that we learned it from, that tibul yom, someone who's, uh, he was tameh, he went to the mikveh, so now he's much less tameh, even though he's not 100% tahor, he's uh, 80% tahor. That's okay, that's good enough for the para. That's the um, important derivation that the rabbis um, make to learn that Tibul Yom is uh, a Tahor in the first place. Okay, so we uh, we went on a tangent for regarding Pada Adoma because we want to compare it to Arel, and now we uh, we concluded that ch- that tangent. Baruch Adonai Amen Amen.